Book Six, The Princess at the River. Far gone in weariness, in oblivion, the noble and enduring man slept on. But Athena, in the night, went down the land of the Phaeacians, entering their city. In days gone by, these men held Hipparia, a country of wide dancing grounds. But near them were overbearing Cyclopes, whose power could not be turned from pillage. So the Phaeacians migrated thence under Norsithous to settle a new world across the sea, Scyria Island. That first captain walled their promontory, built their homes and shrines, and parcelled out the black land for the plough. But he had gone down long ago to death. Alcinous ruled, and heaven gave him wisdom. So on this night the goddess, grey-eyed Athena, entered the palace of Alcinous to make sure of Odysseus's voyage home. She took her way to a painted bedchamber where a young girl lay fast asleep, so fine in mould and feature that she seemed a goddess, the daughter of Alcinous, Nausicaa. On either side, as graces might have slept, her maids were sleeping. The bright doors were shut. But like a sudden stir of wind, Athena moved to the bedside of the girl, and grew visible as the shipman Dimas's daughter, a girl the princess's age, and her dear friend. In this form, grey-eyed Athena said to her, "How so remiss, and yet thy mother's daughter, leaving thy clothes uncared for, nor sickier, when soon thou must have store of marriage linen and put thy minstrelsy in wedding dress. Beauty in these will make the folk admire." And bring thy father and gentle mother joy. Let us go washing in the shine of morning. Beside thee will I drub, so wedding chests will brim by evening. Maidenhood must end. Have not the noblest born Phaeacians paid court to thee, whose birth none can excel? Go beg thy sovereign father even at dawn to have the mule cart and the mules brought round to take thy body linen, gowns and mantles. Thou shouldst ride, for it becomes thee more. The washing pools are found so far from home. On this word she departed, grey-eyed Athena, to where the gods have their eternal dwelling, as men say, in the fastness of Olympus. Never a tremor of wind or a splash of rain, no errant snowflake comes to stain that heaven. So calm, so vaporless, the world of light. Here, where the gay gods live their days of pleasure, the grey-eyed one withdrew, leaving the princess. And now dawn took her own fair throne, awaking the girl in the sweet gown, still charmed by dream. Down through the room she went to tell her parents, whom she found still at home. Her mother seated near the great hearth among her maids, and twirling out of her distaff yarn, died like the sea. Her father at the door, bound for a council of princes on petition of the gentry, she went up close to him and softly said, "My dear papa, could you not send the mule cart around for me, the gig with pretty wheels?" I must take all our things and get them washed at the river pools. Our linen is all soiled, and you should wear fresh clothing. Going to council with councillors and first men of the realm. Remember your five sons at home, though two are married. We still have three bachelor sprigs. They will have none but laundered clothes each time they go to the dancing. See what I must think of. She had no word to say of her own wedding, though her keen father saw her blush. Said he, "No mules would I deny you, child, nor anything." Go along now. The grooms will bring your gig with pretty wheels and the cargo box upon it. He spoke to the stableman, who soon brought round the cart, low wheeled and nimble, harnessed the mules and backed them in the traces. Meanwhile, the girl fetched all her soiled apparel to bundle in the polished wagon box. Her mother, for their luncheon, packed a hamper with picnic fare and filled a skin of wine. And when the princess had been handed up, gave her a golden bottle of olive oil for softening girls' bodies after bathing. Norsicia took the reins and raised her whip. Lashing the mules, what jingling, what a clatter! But off they went in a ground-covering trot, with princess, maids, and laundry drawn behind. By the lower river, where the wagon came, were washing pools with water all year flowing in limpid spillways that no grime withstood. The girls unhitched the mules and sent them down along the eddying stream to crop sweet grass. Then, sliding out the cart's tailboard, they took armloads of clothing to the dusky water. And trod them in the pits, making a race of it. All being drubbed, all blemish rinsed away, they spread them piece by piece along the beach, whose pebbles had been laundered by the sea. Then took a dip themselves, and all anointed with golden oil, ate lunch beside the river while the bright burning sun dried out their linen. Princess and maids delighted in that feast. Then putting off their veils, they ran and passed a ball to a rhythmic beat. 
Nausicaa flashing first with her white arms. So Artemis goes flying after her arrows flown down some tremendous valley side, Taigatos, Erymanthos, chasing the mountain goats or ghosting deer with nymphs of the wild places flanking her, and Leto's heart delights to see them running, for taller by a head than nymphs can be, the goddess shows more stately all being beautiful. So one could tell the princess from the maids. Soon it was time she knew for riding homeward, mules to be harnessed, linen folded smooth. But the grey-eyed goddess Athena made her tarry, so that Odysseus might behold her beauty and win her guidance to the town. It happened when the king's daughter threw her ball off-line and missed, and put it in the whirling stream, at which they all gave such a shout, Odysseus awoke and sat up, saying to himself, Now, by my life, mankind again, but who? Savages, are they strangers to courtesy? Or gentlefolk, who know and fear the gods? That was a lusty cry of tall young girls, most like the cry of nymphs who haunt the peaks and springs of brooks and inland grassy places. Or am I amid people of human speech? Up again, man, and let me see for myself. He pushed aside the bushes, breaking off with his great hand a single branch of olive whose leaves might shield him in his nakedness. So came out rustling, like a mountain lion, rain-drenched, wind-buffeted, but in his might at ease, with burning eyes, who prowls among the herds or flocks or after game, his hungry belly taking him near stout homesteads for his prey. Odysseus had this look in his rough skin, advancing on the girls with pretty braids. And he was driven on by hunger, too. Streaked with brine and swollen, he terrified them, so that they fled this way and that. Only Alcinous's daughter stood her ground, being given a bold heart by Athena and steady knees. She faced him, waiting, and Odysseus came, debating inwardly what he should do, embrace this beauty's knees in supplication, or stand apart, and using honeyed speech, inquire the way to town and beg some clothing. In his swift reckoning, he thought it best to trust in words to please her, and keep away. He might anger the girl touching her knees. So he began, and let the soft words fall. Mistress, please, are you divine or mortal? If one of those who dwell in the wide heaven you are most near to Artemis, I should say, great Zeus's daughter, in your grace and presence. If you are one of Earth's inhabitants, how blessed your father and your gentle mother, blessed all your kin. I know what happiness must send the warm tears to their eyes each time they see their wondrous child go to the dancing. But one man's destiny is more than blessed, he who prevails and takes you as his bride. Never have I laid eyes on equal beauty in man or woman. I am hushed indeed. So fair one time I thought a young palm tree at Delos near the altar of Apollo. I had troops under me when I was there on the sea route that later brought me grief. But that slim palm tree filled my heart with wonder. Never came shoot from earth so beautiful. So now, my lady, I stand in awe so great I cannot take your knees. And yet my case is desperate. Twenty days yesterday in the wine-dark sea, on the ever-lunging swell, under gale winds, getting away from the island of Egygia. And now the terror of storm has left me stranded upon this shore, with more blows yet to suffer, I must believe, before the gods relent. Mistress, do me a kindness. After much weary toil, I come to you, and you are the first soul I have seen. I know no others here. Direct me to the town. Give me a rag that I can throw around me, some cloth or wrapping that you brought along, and may the gods accomplish your desire. A home, a husband, and harmonious converse with him, the best thing in the world being a strong house held in serenity where man and wife agree. Woe to their enemies, joy to their friends. But all this they know best. Then she of the white arms, Nausicaa, replied, Stranger, there is no quirk or evil in you that I can see. You know Zeus meets out fortune to good and bad men as it pleases him. Hardship he sent to you, and you must bear it. But now that you have taken refuge here, you shall not lack for clothing or any other comfort due to a poor man in distress. The town lies this way, and the men are called Phaeacians, who own the land and city. I am daughter to the Prince Alcinous, by whom the power of our people stands. Turning, she called out to her maids in waiting. Stay with me. Does the sight of a man scare you? Or do you take this one for an enemy? Why, there's no fool so brash, and never will be, as to bring war or pillage to this coast. For we are dear to the immortal gods living here, in the sea that rolls forever, distant from other lands and other men. No, this man is a castaway, poor fellow. We must take care of him. Strangers and beggars come from Zeus. A small gift, then, is friendly. 
give our new guest some food and drink and take him into the river out of the wind to bathe. They stood up now and called to one another to go on back. Quite soon they led Odysseus under the river bank as they were bidden, and there laid out a tunic and a cloak, and gave him olive oil and the golden flask. Here, they said, go bathe in the flowing water. But heard now from that kingly man Odysseus, Maids, he said, keep away a little. Let me wash the brine from my own back and rub on plenty of oil. It is long since my anointing. I take no bath, however, where you can see me, naked before young girls with pretty braids. They left him then and went to tell the princess. And now Odysseus, dousing in the river, scrubbed the coat of brine from back and shoulders and rinsed the clot of sea spume from his hair, got himself all rubbed down from head to foot. Then he put on the clothes the princess gave him. Athena lent a hand, making him seem taller and massive too, with crisping hair in curls like petals of wild hyacinth, but all red golden. Think of gold infused on silver by a craftsman, whose fine art Hephaestus taught him, or Athena, one whose work moves to delight, just so she lavished beauty over Odysseus's head and shoulders. Then he went down to sit on the sea beach in his new splendor. There the girl regarded him, and after a time she said to the maids beside her, my gentlewomen, I have a thing to tell you. The Olympian gods cannot be all averse to this man's coming here among our islanders. Uncouth he seemed, I thought so too before. But now he looks like one of heaven's people. I wish my husband could be fine as he, and glad to stay forever on Scyria. But have you given refreshment to our guest? At this the maids, all gravely listening, hastened to set out bread and wine before Odysseus, and ah, oh, how ravenously that patient man took food and drink, his long fast at an end. The princess Norsicia now turned aside to fold her linens. In the pretty cart she stowed them, put the mule team under harness, mounted the driver's seat, and then looked down to say with cheerful prompting to Odysseus, Up with you now, friend, back to town we go, and I shall send you in before my father who is wondrous wise. There in our house with him you'll meet the noblest of the Phaeacians. You have good sense, I think. Here's how to do it. While we go through the countryside and farmland, stay with my maids behind the wagon, walking briskly enough to follow where I lead. But near the town, well, there's a wall with towers around the isle and beautiful ship basins right and left of the causeway of approach. Seagoing craft are beached beside the road, each on its launching ways. The agora, with field stone benches bedded in the earth, lies either side Poseidon's shrine, for there men are at work on pitch-black hulls and rigging, cables and sails and tapering of oars. The archer's craft is not for the Phaeacians, but ship designing, modes of oaring cutters in which they love to cross the foaming sea. From these fellows I will have no salty talk, no gossip later. Plenty are insolent, and some sea dog might say after we have passed, Who is this handsome stranger trailing Norsicia? Where did she find him? Will he be her husband? Or is she being hospitable to some rover come off his ship from lands across the sea, there being no lands nearer? A god may be, a god from heaven, the answer to her prayer descending now to make her his forever. Better if she's roamed and found a husband somewhere else. None of her own will suit her, though many come to court her and those are the best. This is the way they might make light of me, and I myself should hold it shame for any girl to flout her own dear parents, taking up with a man before her marriage. Note well now what I say, friend, and your chances are excellent for safe conduct from my father. You'll find black poplars in a roadside park around a meadow and fountain, all Athena's. But father has a garden in the place, this within earshot of the city wall. Go in there and sit down, giving us time to pass through town and reach my father's house. And when you can imagine we're at home, then take the road into the city, asking directions to the palace of Alcinous. You'll find it easily, any small boy can take you there. No family has a mansion half so grand as he does, being king. As soon as you are safe inside, cross over, and go straight through into the Megaron to find my mother. She'll be there in the firelight before a column with her maids in shadow, spinning a wool dyed richly as the sea. My father's great chair faces the fire too. There, like a god, he sits and takes his wine. Go past him, cast yourself before my mother, embrace her knees, and you may wake up soon at home rejoicing, though your home be far. On mother's feeling much depends. If she looks on you kindly, you shall see your friends under your own roof in your father's country. At this she raised her glistening whip, lashing the team into a run. They left the river cantering beautifully, then trotted smartly. But then she reined them in and spared the whip, so that her maids could follow with Odysseus. 
The sun was going down when they went by Athena's grove. Here then Odysseus rested, and lifted up his prayer to Zeus's daughter. Hear me, unwearied child of royal Zeus. Oh, listen to me now, thou so aloof, while the earth-shaker wrecked and battered me. May I find love and mercy among these people. He prayed for that, and Pallas Athena heard him, although in deference to her father's brother she would not show her true form to Odysseus, at whom Poseidon smouldered on until the kingly man came home to his own shore.